Let's get into the word this morning, talking about reality check, talking today as we're continuing in this study on the Sermon on the Mount. Today we're dealing with the subject, what's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with it? Well, we're in the book of Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 43 through 48. What Jesus did, the Sermon on the Mount is crucially important, and what he did in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere Actually, throughout the pages of God's Word in Scripture, he asserts the law's utility. He didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it, as the Word of God tells us. And it was to put people on notice that he would not tolerate them uh, perverting the law for their own benefit. So, you know, we are to take the entirety or the whole of God's Word and apply it to our life. Then a lot of the elements of what we call the law... Uh, are the standards in which we can live by to live clean, moral, outstanding, uh, uplifting lives that will certainly honor God and glorify Him today. And I found that if you really want to build a life that has a lasting significance, not just a quick and pass by type thing, it's a lasting significance that makes an eternal uh, impact, then it all begins with God. Uh, your salvation began with him, and it doesn't end there. That's just the beginning. That's to uh, bring you into the family of God. Then it's a constant growing and developing process where God develops and grows your life to his glory. If you're not keeping God as the focal point of your life, then you're missing life and its, and its blessings. It is so important in these days that we're living in that we keep our attention focused upon the Lord, looking unto Jesus, as the Hebrew writer tells us, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, if you want to know how Jesus thinks, one of the greatest places that you can learn that is by the pages that is containing the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, these scriptures will show you how to know how God thinks and how Jesus thinks. And then Paul tells us in Philippians, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So today, you know, we just think, well, Jesus wants to save my soul. No, Jesus wants to not only save your soul, he wants to take control of your entire life. And if you'll get your thinking right with God, you'll be amazed of how mightily God will bless you today. So we find that the Sermon on the Mount, some people think it's a philosophy. It's not by which we govern society because people don't believe in God. For the most part, if you'll look around today and all the issues and things that are going on and the way that people are living alone says that people do not believe there is a God. I mean, the conduct today that is going on in our nation and across the world reflects today that people have no regard for God and who He is and what He will do. Well, they're going to find out one day He is real. And they're going to find out really... Uh, how important he is to your life, and to miss him is to miss it all. So, thus, they never live by the Sermon on the Mount. I don't expect the world to live by the Sermon on the Mount, but I think God expects us as born-again believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are to live by the principles and uh, what God has exposed to us in godly living through this great teaching that he gave, not only to those who heard him, but for you and I who read his word, and understand what he's trying to uh, birth into our spirit. So only followers of Jesus can live out what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. You've got to have a relationship with him. And I think that's one thing that is lacking in a lot of the lives of people, even in the ranks of the church. They have a religion, but they don't have a relationship. And we've got to have a relationship with the Lord. When Jesus tells us that to love our neighbor as our own selves today, that's a pretty tall order, isn't it? You know, typically the world tells us it's all about numero uno. It's all about number one, which is you. But actually, it's not about us. It's all about Him. And our life today is centered or focused upon the Lord. So understanding this today, He means that we should remember the needs of others uh, like we remember our own. You know, uh, the mentality of so many people today is, well, just let them get it on their own. Let them get through the best way they can. That's, that's the way it works. And we are to encourage one another and to help one another and to be there for one another. 
And what he means today is that we're seeking happiness and we're seeking goodness and peace and security and all the benefits and the blessings of being a child of God, just not for ourselves, but also for the benefit of others that uh, would desire and seek those things in their life. I would l like to think that everyone wants to improve their life. And sometimes you have to be the, the jump start that gets other people to that place. You have to be that tool of encouragement because the world is constantly pushing people down and we are to lift one another up. You're never going to get somebody saved until they see what you've got is genuine and real and that your salvation is just not about you being saved. Your salvation is taking that salvation and investing it in the lives of other people. And uh, that's a salvation issue and it's a caring issue and it's a needs issue. I appreciate uh, our care ministry here at GBC. And what God, how he's using that mightily. And Percy and Judy have just done a marvelous job. And all those who have surrounded them, because it's just not them, am I right? It's a team that has, that is standing with y'all to, to help people and to be a blessing to them. And what a great encouragement that is. And we thank the Lord for people who are willing to invest in the lives of other people and just to simply share a blessing. Not looking for words of gratitude, but just doing it because they love the Lord and they love people. Isn't that what our Christian service is all about anyway? It's about taking what God has put in us and sharing it with other people. And folks, today, I know we live in a bad world, but let me tell you, not everybody's bad. Amen. There's some good people around that have a heart for God. And there's a lot of good people out there that just need a little steering and a little direction and a little guidance and a little help and a little strength in their lives. And guess what God does? He uses us as those tools to send by to bring those blessings to others today. Now, we think about sharing all this goodness, kindness, peace, and grace and all this other stuff of God. So then we think about, well, how do we actually do this? Well, you've got to focus your love towards God first. God can't use you unless he has your first love, unless he has all of your love. And then he takes our hearts and he molds them, he transforms them, and he makes them into hearts that are capable of not just loving God. I found that the more that you love God, the more that you will love other, love other people. The more that you'll be willing to be there and to help other people today. Uh, realizing this today, uh, God has shared his love within us today. But it's just not the issue today. Christ loves us. But he wants us not just to be loved of him, but he wants us to take that love and put action to that love and uh, to be usable for the kingdom. So he fills us up so we can then pour out our lives to his glory and, uh, and bless other people and realize that, you know, we can do it with God's strength and God's help. That's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Amen. So many today has no idea of what love has to do with anything. We have a wrong perception, concept, idea of what love is all about today. Love is not what you say. Love is what you do. And that love is expressed in caring for other people today. If you decided that we, we love our families and, it, and it's desirable that we love our friends too and love our families, but it's difficult for us, sometimes here's where the going gets tough. Oh, we can love those around us. We can love all of our brothers and our sisters in the house of the Lord. We can love uh, our husband, our wife, and our kids. But man, when it comes to, we draw a line in the sand when it comes to loving our foes. Loving our enemies. So I know today the natural thing for us to do is to love those who love us and to hate those who hate us. But that's not what God says. He says to love those that even despitefully use you and persecute you for his name's sake. So realizing this, it, it takes a person of God to love those who do not love in return. See, we don't love to get back. We, we give love because it is, it is an expression of what God has done for us. I mean, Jesus loved us enough. John 3, 16. Let's quote it together. Are you ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not but have everlasting life. Realizing this day, he gave his love. 
that we could experience his love and be changed by his love. We give out the love of God in our living that it will touch the lives of other people. So realizing this today, to answer the question, what's, what's love got to do with it? It has everything to do with it. Because if you say that you know Jesus, then you will have the love of God exhibited in your heart and your life. Of course, we know not everyone returns our love. Not everybody gives back love, but that's okay. God keeps a scorecard, doesn't he? And we're not here to check off people, and if they do or if they don't, we're just here to love people in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. The Bible teaches we are to love, now listen to this, and it's one of your fill-ins. We are to love our enemies. Wait a minute, preacher, you just lost me right there. Well, listen, you love your enemies because Jesus Christ loved us while we were yet his enemies. We were enemies of Christ. Oh, preacher, I, you're wrong. I have never hated God. I have never been an enemy of the cross. You may not have declared it by your mouth, but your actions declared it. Now listen to what Paul said to the church at Colossians, in Colossians 1, 21-22. And you, now he, now he makes it personal. He says, that were sometimes alienated, now listen to this word, and, that's a conjunction, enemies, in your mind in wicked ways or wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled. Thank God where we were, we're not there anymore. We were enemies of God by our actions, our sin, our transgressions, our iniquities. Those things said, I don't want you, God. And you held up a barrier. But thank God he reconciled you to God. Christ did by his atoning blood at Calvary. In verse 22, it says, In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. My Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You become new in Christ today. So realizing this, what Paul is saying in these verses is simply this. Before the cross, we were enemies of God. And he loved us anyway. You can't do anything to stop God from loving you. You can't do, I don't care what sin you commit. I don't care what you think. You cannot stop God from loving you today. The heart of a Christian is we love him because he first loved us. Amen. So understand this. The love that we had, have, it came from him to begin with. And then he has invested that love in us that we can be usable for God. If we love Jesus, and uh, that is the disposition of the condition of our heart, we must then love everything that he loves, and that means that we've got to love our enemies. For God loves every person. Hallelujah. He loves your enemies. He loved his enemies. What did Jesus say to his enemies on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was not a retaliatory statement. That was a statement of love. That he loved so much, he even loved those that, that were responsible that day for driving the spikes in his hands and, and hanging him on the cross. So for the Christian, love has everything to do with it in our lives today. Jesus not only distributes his love to us, and we, all the love that we've got in us today, it comes from him today. But he also helps, wants us to demonstrate love today through us if we are walking with him. And folks, the key is you've got to walk with the Lord if you're going to demonstrate his love. So that being the case, over the next few minutes that we have left, how can we learn to love all people, I didn't say some people, all people, even our enemies, and uh, the way that Jesus loves us. How do we do that? Well, we're going from Matthew chapter 5, 43 through 47, and he gives us three specific instructions today on how that we can become the channels of his love. Let's read the scripture. 43 through 44 says this, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now that's everything against what our flesh says to do. What does our flesh say to do when you get with your enemies? Get even. 
Get them before they get you. Nail them. I mean, you know, we get in that revenge mode. We turn, we, we, that Dr. Jekyll uh, and Mr. Hyde personality. That's not the personality of a Christian. The personality of a Christian is that we are to be like Jesus, right? So in, in verse, verse 43, Jesus is correcting, there again, faulty interpretation of the Old Testament pertaining to the Scriptures and what God has said. A lot of misinterpretation. Jesus is quoting from actually Leviticus chapter 19 that says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the problem was the people's standard of love was too low. Maybe is that our problem today? Our standard of love is too low? Listen, you don't love people conditionally. You don't love people for what they will do. You love people in the love of Christ. And so the, a neighbor, according to the, to the Jews, did not include the Gentiles. So the Gentiles then, they are identified as enemies and so they basically felt that they were not obligated to love anyone who was not out, uh, anyone who was outside of the nation of Israel. They were not obligated to love them. The Jews had a vile heart towards the Gentiles. And so therefore, they didn't express, oh sure, they loved those that were within their camp, but they didn't love those who were outside the camp. Now in Matthew chapter 5, in what we read here, Jesus said, it doesn't matter how you define your neighbor. There's nothing here definitive. He says you're still responsible to love all people. And folks, God hasn't changed his interpretation of his word. We too are responsible to love all people. And I know our first reaction is, but you don't know. Don't even give me the rest of the sentence. Because it doesn't matter. Because what you're doing when you're living in the past of who did you wrong, where, when, and whatever, all you're doing is living in the past that you can't do nothing about. All you're doing is chaining yourself to that person who, however they hurt you. But maybe if we looked at the scorecard, maybe there are places in our lives that we hurt people too. So, I mean, how does this justify then our hatred or our get-even mentality? It does not. This is somewhat... And it becomes difficult today because we all have people in our lives today, honestly, not everybody is easy to love. Right? And maybe we're one of those people that we're a little hard to love sometimes. Now, you know, y'all look like a bunch of bobbing heads. <laughs> are you talking about your, your, your enemies are hard to love or are you talking about you're hard to love? And we, we all sometimes are hard to love, aren't we? If you don't believe that, ask my wife about me. But anyway, yet we, we cannot water down the clarity of the scriptures or of this text. The, the real standard is to love those, and this means even those who hate you. And you've got to understand, only God can enable you to do that. Well, I've got to love you. you that's, you're not going to do it if that's your mentality. You've got to say by the grace of God that you can love a person. Because only God can give you the grace to love a person anyway. So you're a channel. Hey, listen to this, folks. You're a born-again child of God. You are a channel of the love that God has placed within us. And so, therefore, we have to decide that we don't love as the world loves because what's the mentality to the world? Get them before they get you. Get even. Get revenge. You know, that's the mentality. But the world today, they don't have the right standard of love. And we have the right standard by the fact that we love God. And if we love God, then the love of God lives and dwells within us. And then we should be ambassadors or representatives of that love that God has placed within us. Unfortunately, we have enemies somewhere that hate you. I promise you, somebody hates every one of us in this room today. Somebody doesn't like you. Could be a family member, could be a co-worker, could be a neighbor, could be somebody in your past. But I promise you, not everybody loves you. I thought when I went, to, I went into ministry, and uh, that man, I thought, man, everybody would just be excited and happy. And look, boy, I found out real fast, that's not the case. <laughs> you find out who really does love you and who really doesn't, huh? But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter. We're not scorekeepers. We're not figuring out, well, who loves me and who doesn't love me. It matters not. 
You're to love and you're to pray for others today. And you've got to realize that Jesus Christ himself, he can do something in your life and my life today that nobody else can do. He today can enable us to love those that even hate us today. He can heal any broken life. Isn't that amazing? You know, we just think Jesus can only save your soul and touch you if you're sick or work out this little thing over here. Listen, Jesus is into relationships. And that's the way you got into your relationship with him, is by what he gave for you and I. And so realizing this today, Jesus is vitally today concerned and involved in our relationships and our walk. So why do people act wicked and hateful then, Pastor? Because they are acting according to their nature. Because we all have a sin nature. We all have a vile, wicked nature today. Hateful nature. Preacher, I'm just as sweet as honey. Well, maybe you think you are, but you haven't always been that way. None of us have been. But realizing this today, as believers, we need to respond according to not the old nature, but to our new nature. You need to respond to the new nature that God has given you. That means you don't look over your shoulder all the time. That doesn't mean you get all paranoid about somebody talking about somebody, what somebody doing, what, you know, what's going on. About, you, know, it's, you think it's all about me. It's not about you. You ought to live your life for God. Stop living in paranoia and worrying about whether somebody hates you or loves you. Just pour out the love of God into lives of people. God will take care of the rest. Amen. Don't let a lost person keep you from acting like Jesus. Amen. Don't let the world today pull you back into the same mess that you were in. So you can't control others, but you can control how you act and how you behave. And so today, be a responsible Christian and act accordingly as God would desire. Don't let no one rob you of the joy of walking with the Lord. Amen. So could the process of forgiveness lie at our door then? A lot of times that's the very core of the issue today. The moment you hate, you compromise yourself and you place yourself on the same level as the person that hates you. So you're not lifting or pulling yourself up. You actually, you're being pulled down. So the first thing is to raise the standard of your love. Second thing, let me go quickly here. Remember the source of your love. In verse 45 it says, That ye may be the, Christ, or the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Now listen, the fact is today, Jesus is saying that we have a model today of one who loves and gives us the principle today that we are to love our enemies because why? We are the children of God. That's why. This is not saying you can, you can uh, be a child of God and, and ignore today loving others. No, you've got to. You've got to love your enemies because actually today, this is the whole or the complete work of the salvation that God w wrought in us. Your salvation is just not about the fact that your name is tagged in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. And that is a fantastic thing. But let me tell you, if that's all our life was about was going to heaven, then he would have zipped us out of here the day that we got saved. He's got things for you to do. He's got things that he wants to accomplish. He wants you to worship him, certainly. But he wants you to learn the value. Hear me out, church. He wants you to learn the value of relationship and improving relationship. You may never get a person to stop hating you, but that doesn't mean you've got to hate them. That means you've got to love them today. And so, being a child of God is important. Salvation is not the results of anything that we do. Understand this. Jesus reminds us that you love your enemies because you are a child of God. And what you do to the glory of God, you do because you belong to Him. Loving your enemies is not the cause of salvation, but is the result of our salvation. This is the evidence that we belong to God. And if we are walking around with a get-even mentality, something's wrong in your walk with him. We take on the characteristics of the Lord when we what? Love our enemies, right? Preacher, you are giving us a tall order. You know what? By the grace of God, you can do these things. Amen. The source of love is God himself. That is a given. Because he doesn't require us to do anything that he isn't willing to do. 
So therefore, to love God, you have to love what God loves. And guess what? There's not a human being of the 7 billion people on this earth that God doesn't love. You mean he loves all people, nations, creed, color, tongue, you name it? Yes, he does. And what is God's desire? Is that all of them come to repentance and receive him as their personal savior. We do not love people because they are lovable. We love people today because we love God. And so the more you love God, the more you will start loving other people. Now, focus on loving God, for that is how you love. If you will get deeper and richer in your love walk with God, I'm telling you right now, your relationships with other people will improve. Amen. You ever met a hateful Christian? I mean, bless God, they were baptized in pickle juice, it seemed like. Listen, that is evidence that they are not demonstrating and exposing the love of God in their life. What did Jesus say? The greatest commandment was what? It was that we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But let's not forget about the second. The second commandment was that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And we are to love others today. The focus is love God as much as you can. Hallelujah. Verse 46 says, For if you love them which love you, what reward hath ye? Do even the publicans the same? Verse 47. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Now, let's go to verse three. I mean the third point. Third point. You should reveal the substance of your love. So verse 48. But ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So realize, be ye therefore perfect. We are to be perfect. Preacher, I can never achieve that. You can't in the flesh. But in the spirit of God, you can strive for that perfection of God in your life. What does the word perfect mean then in verse 48? It means this. It is the content. It means, uh, in this context, it means <clears throat> moral perfection. <clears throat> excuse me. Moral perfection that corresponds with God's character. So, what is the goal of every Christian then? The goal of every Christian today is to be holy as God is holy. You thought I was going to say to love other people. You can't love other people if you're not walking in the holiness of God. <laughs> you've got to walk with him, man. I mean, you've got to be in relationship with him. This is not about, well, pastor, I'm doing the best that I can. That doesn't work with God. It's not about doing the best you can. Jesus is saying, when we fall short of his word, that is the exception, not the rule. We do not have to live this way today, folks. Listen, God demonstrates love, and we are to demonstrate the love that he has provided in our life to other people. So if you're going to love perfectly today, the way that the Father loves us and has demonstrated that love today, you've got to love your enemies today, as verse 44 states. You've got to love them. Because God has placed his love within you, and he expects you to do that. By loving your enemies the way then you love them in Jesus, God says then, what happens to your enemies, you disarm them. Yeah, let's, let's put it this way. You take all the bullets out the gun. They don't have nothing to shoot you with. Amen. I've, I've tried to always use that as a model in my life. Do the right thing. Take the high road. And don't give people bullets to put in their gun and to shoot you with. By your actions, your deeds, and the way that you live. I don't care what somebody did to you. I don't care how sorry it was, how vile it was, how wicked it was, how evil it was, or whatever. If it was birthed out of the very bowels of hell, that does not justify retaliation on our part. We've got to love our enemies and pray for them. And so, do you ever wish bad on somebody? God, I wish you would just beat the snot out of them. I mean, maybe you use other colorful words. I don't know. But... You know what Jesus says we're to do? Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Instead of spending all your effort. You know what it does to you? It drives your blood pressure up. It stresses you out. You can't eat. 
It develops all kinds of issues for yourself. You can't sleep at night because you're just laying there talking. I'm I gotta get. I'm gonna go. I gotta get. You know, and you're just consumed with this thing. That's not what God wants for you today. Don't wish bad on your enemies today. Pray for them, even those who persecute you today. This is a very critical step in our lives today. And as I close, when you pray for someone, this is what happens. God then begins to change your heart. And that's what God wants to do. If you are praying for someone, you cannot continue to hate someone. So your prayer life, what does it do? It changes your heart to God's glory, and then it brings blessings to other people today. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, Jesus dealt with some tough stuff in this Sermon on the Mount. And folks, if we will follow his instruction, oh my God, he'll open the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing. And it's not important what we get on this side. What is important is when we stand before him, that he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. If you got him in your heart, then live him in your life. Amen. Father, thank you this morning for the time that we've had to be in your word, to look at and to talk about this beautiful Sermon on the Mount. Thank you for, Lord, exposing the truth to us that we could be changed by the power of God. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for those who are coming into the house of worship. And, Lord, today may this place be electrified by the Holy Ghost today. Lord, may we worship you, praise you, may we honor you and glorify you, and may great things be accomplished here today. We love you and we thank you for first loving us and help us to be examples of the love of Christ throughout this week and to be the people that you called us to be. We will declare it done and all the praise we give to you and shout the victory for it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said amen. amen. And throw your hands together and praise the Lord a little bit.